Hello knitters, Barbara Benson here. I'm an independent knitwear designer who also likes to make videos here on my YouTube channel, Watch Barbara Knit. Make sure to check in the description notes below the video where you will find links to all of my online shenanigans, including how to get my patterns to knit up for yourself, how to join the Watch Barbara Knit Facebook group, how to support me on Patreon, and where to get Watch Barbara Knit merchandise, as well as anything I talk about in this video today. And there will definitely be a link to last week video and I might even make one of those drop downy thingamajiggers right here that will take you there because this week's video is a follow-up to last week's video and what last week's video was about was thoughts my personal thoughts on pattern layout and like the design of the pattern layout if you are considering writing your own patterns and putting them out there for other people to use uh, it's in line with my whole strategy with this entire channel about maybe talking about things that aren't talked about quite as much and just, you know, behind the scenes kind of stuff. And it's interesting because, yes, I believe there are some newbie or aspiring designers who watched the video and found it interesting. But also there were a lot of comments and feedback that people just liked seeing under the hood, uh, if you might want to call it that way or made them think about uh, patterns that they've used and why, <laughs> you know, their inability to really effectively implement the pattern is not as much about their ability or lack of ability to knit, but more about how the learning style or the communication style of the designer and the knitter just didn't click with each other. And it really makes me happy to hear in those comments that I made some people feel better about themselves because they, they had been under the impression that they were just like, I don't know how to do this. When in reality, it's just that the communication style wasn't clicking with their uh, learning style because there are so many different designers and everybody commutes communicates very differently. So if you're interested in that and didn't watch last week's video, click on the link or in the thing below or whatever, and go back and watch that. Hopefully you will find it interesting. My intention last week was to talk about that, but also cover the idea of style sheets, which I totally ran out of time because I try to keep my videos, uh, I try to keep my videos between 15 and 20 minutes. Sometimes they creep up towards a half an hour, but I really don't think y'all want me to talk about this kind of stuff for hours on end because I can do that, but it might get boring. So I cut it short and asked if anyone was interested in the style sheet ideas and thoughts. And there were enough people in the comments that said, yes, they would like it. So that's what this video is. And first off, I think that what I really need to mention is what is a style sheet in this context. Now, um, it is possible that there are things called style sheets used in different contexts. I'm talking about specifically a style sheet as used in knit and probably crochet in this industry and in this design kind of concept. And they're really two distinct kinds of style sheets that I'm going to talk about because they have two very different purposes. First off, which ties into the idea of pattern layout and design is the pattern style sheet that you make as a designer for yourself to make conscious choices about how you want your patterns to be formatted and also to help you help yourself to remain consistent so that your patterns look the same from pattern to pattern to pattern. I know if you're just getting started, this probably isn't something that you're really thinking about when you're putting out your first pattern. You're like, oh no, I know exactly how that's going to go, but let me tell you, I never thought I <laughs> would personally be con still writing patterns, uh, uh, it's 13 years, 13 years later. So you want to have a consistency. I never thought I'd have over 150 published patterns. Um, you want your patterns to be consistent and you want people to 
have a predictable product. Now, I'm not saying that my patterns haven't changed at all. Hopefully they've improved to feedback as far as layout and design goes, but you want people to really have a better idea of what they're getting into. Um, and they, you guys out there, when you go and you look for patterns, you're not necessarily looking at the date it was published. And if you stumble across one of my patterns from 2012 that you really, really like, I would hope that you would have as good of an experience with it as a brand new pattern that is coming out. So the style sheet is something you create and it's something I really encourage you if you are an aspiring designer to think about from the drop. This is not something to like retroactively implement because let me tell you that, that is a giant pain in the butt because I have done several major overhauls of my patterns and at one point it was just going back and I had to like overhaul like maybe 30 patterns but then there was a point where I had to overhaul a very large number of patterns and that you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so if you do it, like if you do it good from the beginning, that's a really uh, a better choice in my opinion. So what we're going to look at is this is, and honestly, in looking at this to talk to y'all about it, I realized I really need to update my style sheet because it's really out of date. Um, if you look down here, this was last updated in 2014. So, <laughs> but uh, the tech editors that I use um, are already familiar with my style and they have seen it evolve so they know what's going on. And that is one of the multi-purpose things for a style sheet. As I said, the style sheet is here for you to figure it out and for you to keep yourself consistent, but it is also a communication tool between yourself and your tech editor. So you send this to your tech editor so they know what your specific choices are and they can catch when you've made errors um, and or they will see something that might flag as an error to them but if they look in your style sheet, be like, oh no, they did this on purpose. And honestly, for my style sheet, and you can ask my tech editors, that is what a lot of this is because my style is a little bit non-traditional. I've made some choices that are, as I explained in last week's video, that are based on how I like to use patterns that aren't really industry standard. So I've had them flagged by tech editors as errors. And I'm like, no, 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 that's very very much on purpose. So as I've been babbling, you might have been reading this. So this is going to give you an idea of exactly how detailed you really need to make conscious choices. And so like this beginning stuff here, um, I'm going to show you actually real quick. So this is my style sheet and see if you look up here, it says style sheet tech editor. This is what I send to the tech editor. So the tech editor doesn't really get all of this because this is for me to remember how wide are my margins. And it's like if my template ever gets messed up or if I accidentally delete something or something, exp whatever, this is what we do. And so you can see that my cover inch, you know, how big are my cover images? How big is the sidebar? How big is the body bar? And then to the detail of having a 0.1 inch right margin or a 0.1 inch left margin and then we've got the font sizes for the title, the byline, the body text. Now all of these have changed, which is why I realized because I have a, uh, a different, I use a different font now. Um, you can see in this actual page, this is Novary's standard. That's what's in this. And it is a more um, serif heavy font. And I have moved to a very lightly serif font because the lightly serif or sans serif fonts are better for people who have dyslexia and make it more legible for them, but it's still fine for uh, neurotypical people. So it, I've, I have changed that. The other main reason I changed the font is because I had to change 
page layout software. And the software that I was originally using was came out of the United Kingdom and I had to replace it with Adobe and they just didn't have the font. So I had to make some choices. I had to make some changes. I did some revamps. So none of this is really accurate anymore. The like the sizes are accurate, but I need to revise all of this. <laughs> but you've got that. But what I wanted to show you is making these things, telling yourself what you're going to do. So in this, it says body text. I'm going to use the 11 point with a left alignment. If I need to emphasize something, I am using Novaruri's book instead of bolding. That just makes it slightly heavier instead of going and clicking bold. I do not have an indent. I have single spacing. After a paragraph, there's a seven point space. In between row, in row, row instructions is four point spaces. So, and this again has changed. I think I'm at six point now. Again, minor changes have happened in feedback to how people use my patterns. Over here, you can see, do I or do I not have a border on the photographs? Yes, I do. And it's just a small one, a one point. Um, like here, sidebar notes, the title is in italics. That is no longer the case. I think I mentioned in an earlier video that italics don't work with the screen readers that uh, people with visual impairments use. So I've eliminated all italics in my current layout. So that's all gone. But I still, I do not capitalize the word note. In the sidebar, it'll say note, colon, and then the information, and it's all right aligned. Uh, because I just didn't want to capitalize the word note. I liked the way it looked. I mean, really and truly, that was an aesthetic decision. Um, but I wrote that down, and this is one of the things that it's the initially tech editors were like, you forgot to capitalize this. I'm like, no, I didn't forget to capitalize this. I chose not to capitalize that because I'm a goober. Um, oh, that keeps on going blue. Okay. So then you get into things that are more specific and what you're trying. And simply making a style sheet helps you think through the choices that you are making and so that they're deliberate and it's not just, oh, that was the default setting for my text editor. Um, and this is something that I very specifically. So if a repeat is two times, then it's like, it'd be knit one, purl one, whatever, the number of stitches, and then the word twice, right? But if it is more than two, then it's whatever the instructions are. The X mean times and then the number spelled out. So it would be knit one pearl two times four, F-O-U-R. Now I very deliberately made that choice because when I am reading, if I see the num, I just a numeral, for me, it immediately puts my brain into like knit four, like K4. P2. I, 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 for me, the number, the numerals are associated with a stitch, like the number of times I'm doing a stitch. So when a set of instructions would say, you know, open parentheses, K4, comma, P2, close parentheses, X, and then the number four, that number four always was like a speed bump for my brain because I kept looking for what stitch that number was associated with. So instead of using the number there, when it's the description of how many times a repeat is repeated, I use the spelled out number because then it differentiates it because people get confused about repeats. And again, that's very particular to me and something I have in my style sheet so that my tech editors aren't, why are you doing this? It's like, I'm doing it on purpose. Um, I don't put a period at the end of row instructions unless it's a complete sentence. Again, <laughs> I actively got in an argument with one of my tech editors about what is a complete sentence in that one. It's just my own personal thing. Um, and again, very specific on how we're doing row numbering. If it's single, you just have the number and then I chose a hyphen. There is a hyphen, not a colon. Rows blank using the ampersand for two rows. And then if it's more than two rows, using the word two 
So we're doing this to this and always with a hyphen after it. And if it's color work, it's gonna be the number of the row, comma, the letter of the color. And sometimes I do using that color, especially when I get into more complex color work, trying to make things clear. I have a very specific set of reasons on how I use the bubbles and where they go. And then finally, why are you turning everything blue? Stop it. <laughs> um, I keep this, now this is a PDF that I'm showing you, but I keep it as a living document and I am constantly putting in, when I write the stitch description, I put it into this document so that when I need to put that stitch description into a pattern, I just copy and paste it. And again, this is all about having consistency across your patterns, across your products. So I don't have to rewrite every single time what the instructions are for make one left and make one right. I just come into this document, I copy it, I paste it into my new document so that I know that my instructions for make one right, make one left, slip one, knit two together, all my abbreviations are constant and consistent across my patterns. So if when someone has, um, has worked one of my patterns, it's gonna be the same. But you do always need to read these instructions because sometimes for some reasons it will change um, specifically. And if it is, sometimes I'll give it a different name and try to really highlight the fact that it is a non-standard way of working that stitch. So, and then this is my yarn and notions panel, which we talked about previously. So this is, see, and like here, I used to have the, the note explaining my sidebar used to be in italics. It is no longer in italics. I have a specific thing. The stitch counts are nine point in a bracket at the end of the line. Um, and I've actually changed the formatting of that. Uh, so there, there are some minor differences. And actually, when I sent this, it said, if increased section formatted um, plus minus, considering changing it to one stitch, increase, decrease, I have changed to one stitch, increase, decrease, because it just seemed to be more clear for other people. This way worked really well in my brain, but it didn't work after feedback for other people. So, you know, I can, I try to change. So that is a style sheet. That is the style sheet that you make for yourself. And really in making a style sheet like this, as I said, I really feel it helps you really stop and think about the choices that you're going to make when you are communicating and how you are writing your patterns, but also it allows you to stay consistent and you only have to make those decisions once. Once you've made that decision, once you know what you wanna do, you can just do it the same way over and over and over again and it streamlines the process. Um, now, and again, it's a communication tool between you and your tech editor so that your tech editor knows what it is that they need to be double checking um, as far as your pattern layout and your communication style goes. Uh, tech editors do way, 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 way more than that. That could be a totally other video if anyone's interesting as far as what a tech editor does. And uh, I will give you one, uh, strongly held opinion of mine just again since we're talking in the vague idea that you might be thinking about designing your own patterns test knitting is not a substitute for tech editing i'm not going to say you shouldn't do test knitting if that's something you want to do you can do it but it, it is not instead of tech editing and in fact if you are doing test knitting the pattern that the test knitters receive should be tech edited. It is you knit the thing, you write it, you send it to your tech editor. Once it's tech edited, then it goes to test editor, test knitters and you can revise it. And if there's enough revisions, it might have to go back to your tech editor, but tech editing and pattern like test knitting are two very, very different things. They serve very, very different purposes and they do not substitute for one another. That's a soapbox. Okay, but we're stopping because I can get really agitated about it. Now, let's go back to here. The second type of style sheet, the, they're called style sheets again. If, you know what, hang on, let me, let's go, let's, let's make me big. 
Again, assuming you're either an aspiring designer or a nosy Parker who wants to know what goes on behind the scenes or just somebody curious about that sort of thing. A style sheet, as I said, it's a communication tool between the designer and the tech editor, but it is also a communication tool between a third party publisher and the designer. And what happens with this is if you are an aspiring designer or a designer and you have submitted proposals, again, something that could be a whole different video, to a third party publisher, be it a independent dyer, be it a book, be it a magazine, be it an online something. It's just something where you are uh, proposing a design and then someone else is going to decide if your design fits in with whatever collection they're making. And that collection is going to be uh, tech edited, photographed, and published by someone who is not you. That is called third party publishing. And what happens in those collections is those collections uh, have multiple different designers in it, but they still need to have a single voice, um, which is why if you have run across any of my patterns in third party publications like the Star Wars books or Ply Magazine or um, Interweave Knits or any of those, actually even my books, the voice that you are going to find in these third party publications, my books aren't technically third party publications, but I was just thinking, uh, the voice is not going to be the distinctive voice of an independent designer that you maybe have come to know. And that is because the third party, the publisher of this collection, is going to send a style sheet to the designers. And when you, as the designer, are creating the pattern and writing the pattern, it's your job to write that pattern in accordance with the style sheet that has been given to you. And that style sheet is going to be a lot of what we just discussed uh, for our own personal style sheets in that it's going to define how abbreviations are done. It's going to define how you do parentheses and repeats and uh, numbers and all kinds of things. So I have one here. I was trying to think, um, I have this one here, which this third party is no longer publishing. So I thought it would be just fine to just show it quickly, but also this is one of the most extensive and well-written style sheets I have ever received from a third party publisher, it really ensured that you have a unified voice from a disparate number of designers. And they're very specifically. So if you are going to design for a third party, you have to go by these rules and what it is. It's like they're very specifically like, like really specific. Do not submit your pattern as a at PDF. Give it to me as word. Um, round all fractions to the nearest quarter inch, present them unformatted in instead of, um, you're going to use this one slash this instead of 0.25, use fractions, um, round to the nearest half centimeters, and then some very specific instructions on do not direct readers to work as for X reverse all shaping, write it out very specific information on how to write the raglans information capitalize the first letter of chart names um do all of these things so that people and then this is super important this is how they want repeats formatted use knit one per one semicolon repeat from exclamate from asterisk to end do not do parentheses do not do any of these kinds of things um, and say use, she says, do use this, do use the double hash marks, do not use um, the word inch, use about, not approximately, use before, not, do not abbreviate that. So it's a whole bunch of 
um, they prefer continue cont in pa continue in pattern instead of work in pattern. So these are just very specific. See, they want a capital M with the one instead of a lowercase m with a one. And I prefer the lowercase m with the number because it makes me see it better. Again, so if I was writing for this, I would have to modify my style because I would be using the M1 like this and they want it like this. You know what? I'm gonna do it the way they want me to do it because it's their publication. So then we have refer to these examples for the preferred formatting and phrasing. So they have presented with multiple different types of patterns and how these patterns are structured and that is how they want you to write the pattern. And this is very much where I was saying you're not necessarily going to get that designer's voice because like this structure here, this structure here where what you do is you present the stitch guide. So how to do the stitches is presented and then you're essentially told how to assemble those stitches. Um, that's not like a style that I typically use. I've done it occasionally, but it's not how I do. But here's a cardigan. So you can see this just goes <laughs> on and on. And it looks kind of overwhelming, but it's not that it's overwhelming uh, because really you're only going to be designing one pattern. And this is multiple different ex examples. You would just go through and find out which example works for your particular uh, contribution. Um, but things like here, where it's telling you how to set up multiple, how they want multiple sizes to look. All of these things have to be consistent throughout the final product. And then here is them showing you how they want, like here. So they have SL as slip. I personally only use S for slip because <laughs> Mostly it's when it says S L one, it looks like S 11 to me. So I just, I chose to eliminate the L, but writing it for, uh, this particular, uh, um, publisher, I would put the SL in there. You just have to do what they tell you to do. Oh, with yarn in back. See, I put the I in here, like W Y F I do W Y I F. Again, personal choice. You just need to look at what the, you just need to look at what your particular uh, collaborator is asking you to do and write to it. What we have here is, and we're coming up on half an hour again, a lot of stuff about style sheets. Style sheets are two different things. They're a communication tool with yourself, they're a communication tool with your tech editor, and they are a communication tool from a third party, uh, third party to a designer who is being included in a third party collection. So that is what you need to know. There's probably more that we could talk about about uh, style sheets. Um, if you have, if I said anything ridiculous, or if you have any questions, or if that made you think of anything else that made you be like, oh, but what about, please feel free to let me know in the comments, ask away. I enjoy the comments. I enjoy talking to everybody or come over to the Watch Barber Knit Facebook group and we can always continue the conversation there. If you like this video, please give it the thumbs up, click that like button. And if you would like to be notified whenever I upload a new video, please subscribe to my channel and select notification. Thank you so much.